أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين رب آبائنا الأولين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وحبيبنا وعزيزنا محمد وعلى معيته الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته المنتجبين المنتخبين Dear brothers, dear sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته And it goes without saying we welcome each other to this weekly meeting of minds and hearts around the revelation and the definitions and the meanings, the instructions, the teachings, the guidelines that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to humanity. It just happens from among all of humanity we are the ones who more or less are opened to understanding Allah, His light, and the enlightenment that comes with that light. Provided ignorance does not stand in the way, provided we don't stumble on egos and self-centeredness, whether that pertains to an individual or whether that pertains to a crowd of people, however large that crowd may be. So we will put our hands and hearts together and walk through these passages in Surah Al-Baqarah I believe the last time we were around Ayah 245. Uh, the Ayah begins by saying, مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يُقْرِضُ اللَّهَ قَرْضًا حَسَنًا فَيُضَاعِفَهُ لَهُ أَضْعَافًا كَثِيرًا وَاللَّهُ يَقْبِضُ وَيَبْسُطْ وَإِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ uh, This Ayah is saying, who is there anyone who is willing to offer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a, uh, a nice loan, qardan uh, hasana, a loan that in and of itself has the potential of improvement and progress. فَيُضَعِفَهُ اللَّهُ أَضْعَافًا كَثِيرًا Whoever is willing to do that, Allah is willing to increase and multiply that many times over. We notice here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala phrased this offer in financial terms. Being that gains and profits are so dear to human nature, to human beings, that Allah is crowding out that impetus in us, that proclivity that we have for market activities and gaining wealth and gaining profits, he's crowding that out in our psychology by saying there is a market activity that is more profitable than anything that you may have. So it's not per chance that the wording of this offer is done in financial 
or in fiduciary terms. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to obtain the maximum profit available. Wallahu yaqb, and then the ayah goes on, Wallahu yaqbid wa yabsut. It is Allah who causes these amounts of gains and losses. He causes them to increase or to decrease. This is a function uh, throughout a person's lifetime and throughout the lifetime of humanity in which we can identify the fact that whatever you gain in this world is not permanent. Whatever civilizations, civilizations have a life span of hundreds of years, whatever they gain is not permanent. The same thing with whatever you lose. Whatever you lose is not permanent. And whatever a civil, you as an individual, and whatever a civilization loses is not permanent. There is a fluctuation in personal lives, and there's a fluctuation in population lives. And that fluctuation is attributable to Allah. Wallahu yaqbidu wa yabsut. وَإِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ And to him, to Allah, all of you are going to return. So that reduces the value of whatever a person thinks he or she may be in possession of in this world. The real possession is what Allah is offering you what Allah is promising you and what will be eventually fulfilled by Allah. وَإِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ So don't, don't try to put uh, a frame of understanding on the ups and downs of this world and the give and take of the market. These are transient developments. And rest assured that if you are listening and obeying Allah Jalla wa'ala, that whatever He is offering diminishes everything else that you measure as worldly gainful objects. So, وَإِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ At that time, there's not going to be any fluctuations. When we return to Allah, all of these worldly developments, the pluses and the minuses uh, in our uh, uh, financial books, all of this is going to be gone. And what counts is the ultimate judgment and the bottom line, and the bottom line is not here, is not now. The bottom line is wa ilayhi turjaun, and to him, his majesty and glory, subhanahu wa taala. To him, all of you are going to go back to. Now we go to ayah number 246. This ayah says, Alam tara ila al-mala'i min bani Israel min ba'di Musa idh qala lahum nabiyuhum idh qalu li nabiyin lahum ابعث لنا ملكا نقاتل في سبيل الله. Okay, first let's put our minds and our hearts together 
and visit this first sentence in the ayah. It says, Alam tara. Remember we explained alam tara in the previous uh, in the previous uh, presentation. Alam tara, have you not seen? And we said seeing is uh, 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 vision is the master of the senses and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to a portion of history in the past. Allah is saying to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and he's saying to everyone in the footsteps of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he's saying to all of us Alam tara, have you not seen? Oh, obviously we haven't seen. No, I haven't seen. So this is another uh, lesson that serves a purpose for those who want to understand the Qur'an in the literalist sense. No, I haven't seen. Alam tara, I haven't seen. But Allah here is developing our understanding and He is saying to us, have you not visualized as a matter of learning and understanding from past events this is one of these past events. There's many of them in the Qur'an. أَلَمْ تَرَى إِلَى الْمَلَأِ مِنْ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ We explained al-mala'. These are the big shots. These are the high-ranking officials. These are the prominent decision makers. Al-mala'. They are the ones who fill the public mind with their selected information with their deliberate propaganda, with their thought-out strategies, these are al-mala. Take this word al-mala and understand who it applies to in today's world. Alam tara ila al-mala min bani Israel. Okay, so we have. Uh, the materialistic cream of the crop of society. But here Allah is telling us this is a specific society now in a particular part of history. That is Bani Israel. Alam tara ila al mala'i min Bani Israel min ba'di Musa in a time after the Prophet. Moses. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. So this is a chapter, Allah here, subhana, is taking us to visit an extremely important development in the history of Bani Israel from which he wants us to learn not to behave like Bani Israel. Okay, so let's follow the words, let's follow the ayah. Alam tara ila al mala'i min Bani Israel min ba'di Musa iz qalu li nabiyin lahum. As they said, as these head honchos of Bani Israel, the chieftains of the children of Israel, they said to a prophet of theirs, notice that Allah Ta'ala Hikmatuh did not tell us which prophet that was. And in the history of Bani Israel and their adverse human nature, there have been hundreds, 
if not thousands of prophets that came to them. So here, it's not defined which prophet. And it doesn't say, serve a purpose as far as we are concerned to know which prophet that is. We don't want to lose sight of the moving picture here. And that is the collective behavior of Bani Israel. So they approach a prophet of theirs. We know the rank of the prophet. Honorable. Esteemed. Honest. Forthright. In communicating Allah's message to the children of Israel. إِذْ قَالُوا لِنَبِيٍّ لَهُمْ Allah wants us, of course there's been many interactions between Bani Israel and this prophet, whoever it may have been, many of them. But Allah is selecting a particular time, a particular development in this interaction between the prophet and Bani Israel. So here we are. Now we, we are going to focus on this moment, on this issue that right now we are going to discover in the following words and in the following ayat. إِذْ قَالُوا لِنَبِيٍّ لَهُمْ إِبْعَثْ لَنَا مَلِكًا نُقَاتِلْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ They said, the elites, the communicators, the ones who have clout in the society or in the community of Bani Israel. They said to the Prophet, to their Prophet, Ib'ath lana malikan nuqatil fi sabilillah. Send us A Malik is a designation of a person who is in charge at the highest level. So, depending on the context, depending on the circumstances, depending on the individual himself, the word Malik can be, and this is in the overwhelming majority of cases, it is translated or understood to be either a monarch or a king. Now, that's true in many uh, situations. It could also be a sovereign. It could also be a potentate. It could also be a chief executive. It could also be the ultimate decision maker. So here... Here we have, you have to understand, we all have to understand that this prophet, and we know the position of prophets, is that they should be consulted and referred to as the ultimate decision maker in that society. So we sense here in the request by Bani, by the Mala of Bani Israel, we sense here that they are making a distinction between a prophet as a prophet, which in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala currently and historically throughout prophetic history, the prophets themselves should be considered by their followers, the leaders, the ultimate decision makers, the highest quote unquote officials, if we want to use that word. So instead of Bani Israel asking the prophet himself to be a melik, a person who'd have the executive power for what? Nuqatil fi sabilillah. So that we will engage in 
a fight in combat duties in a war of sorts on a course to Allah. So in this, in, in the way they phrased their question to their prophet, you sense a secular attitude. It doesn't mean that they are particularly and obviously secular, but it indicates that that was an undercurrent in their understanding and in their approach to their own prophet, who they did not question his prophethood. إِبْعَثْ لَنَا مَلِكًا نُقَاتِلْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Send to us a malik so that we may engage in warfare for the sake of Allah on a course to Allah. Okay, and it stops here. This is how they approached and this is what they wanted. What was the answer of the Prophet to them? He said to them, قَالَ هَلْ عَسَيْتُمْ إِنْ كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْقِتَالُ أَلَّا تُقَاتِلُوا What if this is his? Um, uh, this is the English phrasing of their of the prophet's response to him. He, he's saying to them, "But what if the obligation of going to war is mandated upon you, but then you refuse to go to war? What if that happens?" So, the answer of this prophet to these types of children of Israel, remember when we say Bani Israel, we're not saying Al Yaqub, because there is a racial and a racist and a tribal and an ethnic component to their thinking and their psychology. So the prophet here, who knew them very well, he's their prophet. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses a prophet, he chooses someone who understands his own people better than anyone else. So he understood who they are. And he had a reservation in himself. And that reservation was, what if the time, what if there comes to these people, to Bani Israel, a commander and takes them on the war path and the time comes for them to face off with the enemy, they're not going to do it. He had that hunch in him. These people are not going to fight. فَهَلْ عَسَيْتُمْ إِنْ كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْقِتَالُ أَلَّا تُقَاتِلُوا But what if? There's a possibility. There's a probability more than a possibility. That when the time comes for you to get engaged in actual warfare, you're not going to do it. This is the type, this is not a historical psychology that Allah is speaking to us about. This is a psychology that is part and parcel of the racial and racist makeup of Bani Israel. فَهَلْ عَسَيْتُمْ إِنْ كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْقِتَالُ أَلَّا تُقَاتِلُوا Okay, so first Al-Mala' from Bani Israel asked the Prophet that they wanted an executive commander who will lead them on the warpath on the course of Allah. 
the response of the Prophet was in a very polite and very dignified manner. He said to them, uh, but I sort of doubt that if this happens and you have uh, a chief of staff who will commandeer you in a war, that you're not going to fight. Now they will respond. Al-Mala' min Bani Israel now is talking back to the Prophet. What did they say? Qalu, وَمَا لَنَا أَلَّا نُقَاتِلَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَقَدْ أُخْرِجْنَا مِنْ دِيَارِنَا وَأَبْنَائِنَا They respond and say, which on the surface, surface of it is a very authentic or a very factual uh, answer to the Prophet. But why would we not engage our enemies in warfare, being that we were expelled from our homes and our homeland and from our own, we've been dislocated from our own families. وَمَا لَنَا أَلَّا نُقَاتِلَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَقَدْ أُخْرِجْنَا مِنْ دِيَارِنَا وَأَبْنَائِنَا So they have a point here. Look, we have nothing to lose. We've lost our homes. We've lost our country. And we've been separated at the family level from each other. So why would we not fight for our rights? Now, up until here, we've listened to Al-Mala from Bani Israel, and we've listened to their prophet at that time. Now the ayah takes us. Now, all, remember, all of this may have not happened in two minutes. There may have been, okay, let's, uh, let's discuss this among ourselves. When the Prophet told them, well, you know, there's a, there's a good chance that if war comes to war, you're going to cop out. You're going to exclude yourselves. Uh, and then they respond to him saying, but we have no excuse to do that because we've hit rock bottom now. There's nothing else to lose. We have to fight. So this, these types of discussions may have taken days, may have taken weeks, whatever the case is, this is what went back and forth between them. And it may have been uh, uh, evolving in one day. The, uh, the fact it, the, the time frame here is not as important as understanding the, the principle and the behavior. So the ayah now takes us to, it jumps to the last step. فَلَمَّا كُتِبَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْقِتَالُ تَوَلَّوْ When the time came for them, to engage in combat duties, tawallaw. They turned their backs and went the opposite direction. You think this is, here we are entertaining ourselves with some uh, historical information. Allah is relaying this to us because He wants us to get an A in history. Is, is that why we're reading these ayat? Or are we reading and understanding these ayat to understand Bani Israel today, now, and here? فَلَمَّا كُتِبَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْقِتَالُ تَوَلَّوْا إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِّنْهُمْ Except for a few of them. See how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is extremely accurate and not dismissive, even if there was a few of them who stood there principled and ideological 
and covenant grounds, he still mentions there was a few of them who did not turn their backs. إِلَّا minhum. Remember, we, we encountered this إِلَّا قَلِيلًا minhum in previous ayat. At other times in the history of Bani Israel. So any Muslim, remember this brothers and sisters, any Muslim who is trying to generalize. Today we have officials in Muslim countries who generalize on the wrong side of the issue. They want people to believe that all of Bani Israel are committed and there's, there's a few who turn their backs and are the rotten crowd in the, in the Yehudi population. And then there are other Muslims who, I don't know, sometimes because of ignorance, they just don't read the Qur'an carefully, or sometimes it's because of asabiya. They can't be fair to the issue. And here Allah Jalla wa'ala in His precise ayah is telling us, no, the overwhelming majority of them, when the time came for them to sacrifice, no, they turned their back and ran away. Except for a small number of them. إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِّنْهُمْ And this you will find, because of the many ayat in the Qur'an that point this out to us, that this is the right formula and the right equation when we look at Bani Israel. There's going to be the majority of them that cannot stand their uh, convictional responsibilities. And there's going to be uh, a limited amount of them who will. إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِّنْهُمْ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِالظَّالِمِينَ And Allah certainly knows, Allah is most knowledgeable about those who do injustice to themselves and who do injustice to their community and who in, do injustice to their cause. Wallahu alimun. Most informed about them. So he's, he's relaying Allah Jalla Sha'nuhu is relaying this information to us and wanting us to know that he's not leaving any gaps and he's not ignorant of any details in this psychology of Bani Israel. Now we go on to ayah number 247. What does Ayah 247 say? If you have a Qur'an in front of you, please feel comfortable to look at the Ayah as we read it together. And it begins by saying, وَقَالَ لَهُمْ نَبِيُّهُمْ And their prophet said to them, إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ بَعَثَ لَكُمْ طَالُوتَ مَلِكًا In actual fact, Allah has sent to you, the children of Israel, طَالُوت In the biblical Judeo-Christian literature, they translate Talut as Saul, S A U L. I I would prefer uh, to avoid the inform. It could be, it could be Saul. I'm not saying it's that's absolutely wrong. But being familiar with language. Uh, Talut. There's no, um, there's no phonetic, there's no voice, sound, pronounced 
relationship between the word Saul and the word Talut. As a matter of fact, if someone digs into uh, Judeo-Christian historical uh, records or chronicles uh, and is familiar with the Semitic languages, uh, the word Saul would be in harmony or we could if if this tal if the word if the name talut was not mentioned as talut in the ayah and it was mentioned as sha'ul sha'ul then that could have been Saul because in the Semitic languages there's an interchange between seen and sheen, the S sound and the SH sound. There's an interchange there. Even within one Semitic language, sometimes the scene becomes a sheen or a sheen becomes a scene. And sometimes in one word that has a scene and a sheen in it, 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 there's an interchange. And I'll give you an example. In the Arabic language, the word shajara means, and it's a Quranic word, the word shajara means tree. In some slants of the same Arabic language, the word is pronounced sajara. Instead of the sh sound, it is an S sound. The word shams, another Quranic word, the word shams, which has SH in it and it has S in it, shams. These could be flipped around and some Arabic-speaking populations would pronounce it Samsh. You will find this still uh, being used in certain populations in North Africa, or instead of saying Shams, they say Samsh. It's not a matter of strict ignorance as much as it's a matter of the uh, versatility of the language. So if we go from strictly the Arabic Semitic language and we step into the Hebrew language, which is another Semitic language, of course the Hebrew language uh, did not survive even though since the theft of Palestine and the Holy Land by the Zionists, there was a rehabilitation of the Hebrew language and it sort of is, I would like to say, it's pronounced nowadays on crutches. Those, especially those um, non-Semitic, the Jews who did not live or continued to live in Arabic-speaking societies, basically Euro-American Jews, when they go to the holy land that they stole and they want to learn Hebrew, they learn it and not pronouncing it right. Anyways, that's a... So, uh, in, 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 in... Now we go back to between Arabic and Hebrew. Both of these are two Semitic languages. You take the word Sept, it's a Quranic word, Saturday. Sept, a Sept. In Hebrew, it is pronounced Shabbat. See, the scene, forget about the vowels here. We're looking at the consonants. The, the, the Arabic scene, the Arabic Semitic scene, became a Hebrew Semitic sheen. And they don't say Sabbat, they say Shabbat, Shabbat. So it, now we go back to the ayah, Talut. In Allah, 
قد بعث لكم طالوت ملكا Indeed, Allah has sent to you, for you, to you and for you, لكم ملكا as the commander-in-chief, the person who's now going to be responsible for issues of war. وَقَالَ لَهُمْ نَبِيُّهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ بَعَثَ لَكُمْ طَالُوتَ مَلِكَا Okay, everything is clear up to here. قَالُوا Now they're responding to the Prophet. قَالُوا أَنَّا يَكُونُ لَهُ الْمُلْكُ عَلَيْنَا now they their question now their true nature is appearing it takes events it takes effort it takes practical things to bring out the true nature and the true character of people in whichever society and this is demonstrated here in this area uh, I think I'm just about approaching the end of this presentation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open up our hearts and our minds to understand these profound meanings that relate to the real world that we are in today. Stay with Allah and He will stay with you. Sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.